All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we have been studying, well, we were about to gain, let's say, a deeper insight into the Fourier transform. That is our current goal to, um, well, if not develop a better understanding, <laughs> because what we are going to do today is, is, uh, is a bit crazy. Um, if it's not about developing a better understanding, it's at least about uh, developing an understanding. And if you remember, um, last time, let me ever so briefly uh, recap what we did, um, I once again pointed out that, uh, what do I have here? Uh, I'll say continuous, continuous functions are infinite dimensional vectors. Infinite dimensional vectors. And um, those are somewhat different vectors than the ones we are so used to. Um, but, well, I mean, the difference is, is really deep, but then again, uh, from another point of view, not so deep. However, to um, sort of indicate that the kind of vectors we are studying, studying right now are not... Um, finite dimensional vectors over the real or the complex numbers. Uh, we wrote them using the Dirac notation. So we write um, cats, this is like this, to indicate um, the vector. This is in a sense uh, what we are used to when we are talking about uh, normal vectors. And uh, we also introduced the notion of brass, where this pointy thing uh, points to the other, other direction. And this is, in a sense, what we talk about when we talk about uh, transposed vectors. Uh, however, remember that this is not only transposition, but also complex conjugation. Okay. Now, with this uh, funny, maybe, new notation, we then saw um, how to write inner and outer products. In particular, for the inner product, inner product, we multiply a bra. Let me see. Also, I assume two functions f and g, uh, two vectors f and g. So for the inner product, we multiply a bra and a cat. And you see the beauty of this naming convention because this is a bracket. And um, this operation produces a scalar. And we also uh, looked into the notion of outer products. Outer products, which um, here is written like so, say, function f, outer product with function g. Now the two pointy things point to each other and the uh, vertical bars appear to the left and to the right. This operation produces, um, say, an operator in uh, finite dimensional vector spaces. These things are called matrices. Uh, matrix, so you may think of this as producing a matrix. Um, this was just uh, notational convention uh, I introduced, which is originally due to uh, Paul Dirac, famous physicist. Um, if you 
if you were ever to read uh, quantum mechanics literature, you will find these things all over the place. Um, and it is really, uh, first of all, because uh, these objects are the objects that are being studied in quantum mechanics. And um, yeah, it is, it is really a beautiful notation that uh, visualizes certain aspects. And we have seen that uh, last time already, and we will make frequent use of that today. So uh, this was just, just uh, reminding ourselves of the fact that we may think of functions as vectors, indeed they are vectors, living in very high dimensional vector spaces, infinite dimensional vector spaces, they are special. And uh, we then asked the following question. You know, whenever we are talking about vector spaces, uh, we may safely assume that there is a, a set of basis vectors. And our question, uh, therefore, was uh, what are the basis vectors? Basis vectors x in this space. In this space. And um, one thing I may not have made sufficiently sharp last time is uh, that we are talking about a vector space whose um, vectors, elements, are functions. And of course, the uh, basis vectors must be functions as well. At least this is just sort of the kind of objects we are talking about. Um, Last time I did not really mention that, I you know, just brought them in form of these cats and, and uh, it is synonymous. Vectors and functions are uh, synonymous for us right now. But when you see this in the current context, then you may also think of this as a function. Now, and in answering this question, um, well, we deduced it. Right? We, we sort of... Uh, thought about like what what would it mean for something to be a basis vector in this space and um, you know just from generalizing what we know about basis vectors in sort of the usual vector spaces um, we required certain properties uh, we required we require um, first of all that these basis vectors are orthogonal. So we require orthogonality and uh, second of all, completeness. Completeness. And that is to say that first of all, we want any two such basis vectors, x and x prime, uh, we want their inner product, their bracket, to evaluate to zero if x is not equal to x prime. And um, the requirement of completeness simply says that if we uh, compute the integral um, over these outer products, lots of uh, rank 1 matrices, uh, this integral is supposed to represent the identity operator. So each of these expressions inside the integral is a matrix. This is um, a rank 1 matrix. It's an outer product of two vectors. This is something like a matrix, and then really difficult to think about matrices that extend from minus infinity to infinity. But these are uh, the kind of objects we are talking about right now. Uh, each term here is an operator, and this integral is, you know, somewhat like a sum over many such operators. And we saw that for the case of um, uh, vectors in finite spaces, that um, if we do this with the basis vectors in finite spaces, the uh, canonical ones that would actually really produce the unit matrix. So we generalize that to our case and we want this to be the identity operator. Uh, this one 
is say equation one and this one is equation two. And um, you know, this so far does not really answer our question. Uh, this is just preparing our answer to the question what are these basis vectors. But these are two properties the basis vectors should have. <coughs> And we continued um, this train of thought as follows. We, we said we may uh, left multiply equation 2 by the bra, say, x, and we may right multiply, right multiply 2 by the cat f and if we do that uh, we find this yields well let me let me do it like really step by step so and then, then we're good this is important um, so we had this uh, integral over these outer products dx prime and um, on the right hand side of the equation sign we had the unit operator that is all we want to have and now we left multiply this by um, this bra and right multiply it by this vector and of course we have to do that on the right hand side of the equation sign as well so here from the left we have that and from the right we have that okay um, and well note that uh, neither this vector nor that vector depends on the um, integration variable so we may just as well pull that into the integral. Uh, typically we sort of pull things out of integrals, but uh, here we actually go the other way around. So this is the same as the integral where we have x times x prime and then x prime times f. All of this is integrated over x prime. And on the right hand side we note um, that this is the um, identity operator, so it does nothing. Well, we can basically get rid of it. That is to say, on the right hand side, we simply have the inner product between x and f. Right. But if x is uh, a basis vector and we compute the inner product of a basis vector with another vector, what we should get is the component of this other vector and along the direction and, and my, my wording is really unfortunate because you know this is this is it, this is how we talk about it it's very difficult to talk about it um, it is easy let me um, yeah, excuse that word uh, <laughs> it is easy to write it down in terms of mathematics but our language is is not necessarily suited to you know really express this but if we have the inner product between a basis vector and and some other vector what we expect to get is the component of this vector along the direction of the basis vector. And this is indeed the um, value of the function f at x. x can be many things, right? If you have a function like sine of x, then for every x you will have a different value. They may repeat, but uh, for every x you can compute the value of f. And this is what we sort of do here. We have the whole function and we just sort of, you know, single out a special, a special value, say x is pi. So this would be function f, say sine, sine at pi. Um, and then um, with respect to the integral on the left hand side of the equation sign, we did lots of arguing. And uh, in the end, um, well not, not really in the end, but um, I said, well, if 
this inner product here is the inner product would be the basis vector x and then the function f, and that is the value of f at x, then, uh, you know, by comparison, this is the value of f at x prime. So let me just plug that in here, f at x prime. And um, arguing and arguing and arguing, I say, well, you can um, rewrite uh, this inner product here. And I introduce this function delta of x minus x prime. All of this has to be integrated with respect to dx prime. And um, on the right hand side, we still have f of x. So that, that is um, where we ended up with. And um, this actually answers our question. Um, before I get back to the answer, I want to point out that uh, using the Dirac notation, we um, can immediately recognize that expressions like this can either be understood as a vector times a matrix times a vector, or just as well as an inner product times another inner product. And uh, we went through that uh, for uh, finite dimensional vector spaces. This is indeed true. And uh, this notation exposes that. It makes it visible. We'll use that a lot today. So this um, result answers our question. Um, because in a certain sense, so, so uh, first of all, this is uh, something we have met under the name convolution earlier. Um, this function here is, is, is not a function. It's something uh, that is actually called a distribution. It's not a statistical. It's, it's another, you know, mathematicians have unfortunately many, many names for the same, uh, different things, same names for different things. It's also called a distribution. Um, it is, from where we are coming from, just defined in the context of integration. There is no other way of, of you know, nailing this one down. Um, so this is, uh, on the one hand, a convolution, but on the other hand, we may just as well think of this as the inner product between this function and uh, function f. So this is actually, these are the basis vectors. These delta functions, delta distributions, are the basis vectors in um, in our space of functions, when we talk about functions f of x, uh, we never think of them as being vectors in a vector space. But if we think of them as vectors in a vector space, then this vector space has a um, canonical basis, and uh, these are the basis vectors. And um, we'll make that sort of like a down once more because it is uh, you know, important and special, especially enough for us to, to uh, remind ourselves of what we found. The Dirac delta, uh, delta function, or I should say distribution, you know, this is, is the better name, um, but in the literature is also called the delta function. Uh, and this name delta function refers to this crazy object here. It is defined, is defined, defined by the properties, properties that, first of all, it um, is zero if x and x prime are not the same, if x is not x prime, and its integral over all possible values of x prime has to be one. Uh, this is what defines that object. And that, that is something we have maybe never seen in our lives before. And um, this is something that is admittedly hard to grasp or hard
hard to accept. And um, you'll see that this thing is even crazier in a minute. Um, and this is, is not a function in the usual sense. It's not a function in the usual sense. Um, but these two things are what define it. Um, crazily enough, this is actually equivalent um, to saying that the, well, yeah, say convolution, x minus x prime, f of x prime, b of dx prime, uh, produces this f of x. This is why this function is also called the sampling function, because if we uh, were either, again, there's many ways of talking about this now, either convolve it with a uh, function f, it produces the value of f at x. Um, or, you know, we can think of this as an inner product. If we compute the inner product between this function and this function, it gives us f in the direction of x. So this, this is um, what defines this crazy function. And we can think of this crazy function as um, producing the set of, of all the basis vectors, like for, for all the x's here. Uh, these two things are indeed two different ways of, of defining them. Right? So that depends on, on what book you read, what, what textbook you may read. They may either say, well, the delta function is the function that has this property. It's quite often in the signal processing literature that they, that they choose this path. Um, in, in the more mathematics literature, you can you know, they sort of define it like that and show that this is a consequence of this. But it's, it's two sides of the same coin. Now, um, yeah? One question. Um, when you're saying that delta x minus x after x prime is 0, and x is not equal to x prime, then we can still write in the integral. Why would you say this delta 0 is equal to 1? It cannot be 1. If you, um, if you evaluate this thing, um, from from uh, this this goes over from minus infinity to infinity, right? And um, if it is zero everywhere except for at some x, uh, this integral um, can cannot um, be anything else than zero. Um, in fact, quite often. Okay, so now that you've asked, I, I actually didn't want to go this down this 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 road, but. Uh, uh. <laughs> Let me, let me do it anyway. Uh, so, um, you may as well define it as zero if x is not equal to x prime and infinity if x is x prime. And, um, but, but this, uh, actually this, is, this has to be true, it has to be infinite at, at uh, this point. Um, but still you need this. So this, this is not enough to, to define the properties of this crazy thing. You still have this constraint here. And really um, only together do these things define this thing that is not a function but a distribution. And the fact that it is not a function is basically really this here. Because if you uh, think of it, um, if you were to do your usual uh, calculus with, with something that involves infinity, you know, things get messy. Um, yeah, this is, uh, what can I say? Um, I would actually love to study this uh, <laughs> more closely. <laughs> I, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. And I know that uh, this here is, uh, is basically impossible to understand in, in just 90 minutes. This, uh, you know, I was a student once myself. This is Sorry. Sorry that I'm doing that to you, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is just to ever so gently uh, show you that for all we are doing, right, when, when we use mathematics in the context of computer science, in the sort of context of practical settings such as image processing, uh, that there usually is a incredibly much deeper truth underneath everything and um, we can uh, confidently use the kind of techniques I have been introducing previously 
because we know that it works. And these are the reasons sort of why it works. Right? Or these are the, the, the deeper truth behind that. And um, once again, uh, even though it may be really, really, really difficult to understand that or to even accept that, uh, I'm doing it anyway because I wanted to show you that this Fourier transform is something that looks incredibly different from anything you have seen before, but in the end, and I'm not giving away the, uh, the punchline, <laughs> I wanted to show you that this Fourier transform is something we know. Right? That we have to first sort of widen our perspective or assume a different point of view and then look at, at everything we have done so far from this point of view and then we say, oh yeah, this is just dot dot dot. So yeah, this, this is uh, what we did last time. It provides another point of view on this idea of convolution and it answers the question like what are the basis vectors in the, or the canonical basis vectors in the vector space of uh, continuous functions over one uh, variable. All of this also works for higher dimensional functions. Right? I could do this with the arguments x and y, x, y, z, two dimensional, three dimensional, n dimensional functions. No, it doesn't, you know, it works as well. Okay, um, what we are going to need today is something even crazier. And uh, this craziness results from answering the following questions. What about derivatives? Can this delta function be derived? Can we compute a derivative? Uh, let's see. Um, what we are going to do is we simply consider this um, uh, integral we already had, but now we do it with, um, I don't know, the, the x delta x minus x prime. And this is supposed to say that we want to consider the derivative of this delta x and we uh, compute this integral uh, dx prime. Um, and we note that um, the variable integration and the thing we want to, uh, to which we, with respect to which we want to derive are different. Right? And that allows us to pull this out of the integral. But this, this operation of differentiation can be pulled in front of the integral because this dx is not this dx prime. So this is the same as um, d dx of the integral delta x minus x prime f of x prime dx prime. But what could this be? What could this be? Well, this is something we have seen earlier. This is just f of x, and now there is a ddx in front of it. So this is ddx f of x. And there you have it. So, which is to say, if we compute the either convolution with the derivative of the delta function or the inner product with the derivative of the delta function, what we get is function f, first derivative. And that is um, again uh, showing that this um, that this delta function is something really special. Um, I don't know, no other no other object would have this property, and um, can actually generalize that. And I'm just doing this right now, and I'm only really writing it down to um, emphasize the craziness of this thing. So in general, we have, in general, we have that if we were interested in the nth derivative, so the n dx n of this x minus x prime, the delta x minus x prime, um, yeah, I'm just writing it down and say something about it in a second. Then this is delta x minus x prime, the n, the 
makes sense. So uh, this looks crazy because it appears that I have just sort of uh, moved this from the front to the back. Um, and uh, well, yeah, huh. I, I did. <laughs> what is this? So this is this is ob ob actually, sorry, obviously um, the application of an operator. To a function, and we have talked about operators when we talked about gradients and so forth. This is the application of an operator to a function, and for this crazy function, this has the same effect uh, in a certain sense as if we were to use this function uh, and integrate it. This is only defined in the context of integration. So, if we were to integrate sort of this thing with respect to any function we are interested in, any f. This, this is what, what that means. This thing is, is not defined otherwise. This, this is, and, and there you can see that it's not, not a function in the sense um, you are used to. But with this thing here, we could compute further. We could now you plug this into an integral and then sort of integrate it with some other function f and we would get uh, corresponding derivatives of that function f. That is what that means. And the fact that I have to use so many words to make that sure, or I, 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 clear, not clear, sorry, <laughs> to try to explain that, uh, again shows you that these things are really special. Okay, but um, this is uh, all we need to know for right now, because now we are finally going back to the Fourier transform. That is, in the end, what we are trying to understand here. So, back, back to the Fourier transform. And the recall how the Fourier transform was defined, um, capital F of omega is 1 over square root of 2 pi and then I drop the integration boundaries, it's you know, tedious. And uh, today I'll write it like so. f of x prime e to the minus i omega x prime dx prime. The, the only difference to how I have been writing it so far is that um, so far I just said f of x e to the omega x dx. But I can as well call it x prime. And for our purpose, this is, is a good idea. So this was the Fourier transform. And the inverse Fourier transform, f of x, is 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the integral, f of omega, e to the i omega x dx. Uh, the omega, sorry. Omega. And note that uh, this one is an x without a prime and this one is an x without a prime. I do that deliberately. Right? Uh, this one here is 3 and this one is 4, equation 3 and 4. And all we are going to do right now is to plug in equation 3 into 4, which is to say we replace this capital F of omega with all of this and see what happens. So, let me see if I can fill that on one whiteboard. Um, Plugging equation 3 into equation 4, we find no, um, f of x is 1 over square root of 2 pi the integral. And now I am replacing everything we had for f of omega by the expression for f of omega. 1 over square root of 2 pi integral f of x prime e to the minus i omega x prime dx prime that is f of omega and then we have 
some integrals times something, there are two functions in here that depend on omega, and we are integrating with respect to omega. Um, and, uh, well, we, we may rearrange this. Instead of first integrating with respect to x prime, we can also first integrate with respect to uh, omega, right? Let's do that. And um, I am now multiplying this uh, two square roots together. If we do that, we get that all of this is the integral over um, 1 over 2 pi. And here we have the integral e to the i omega. And I'm multiplying this one and this one together, these two exponentials. I'm multiplying them together. Um, and this is just x minus x prime. And the omega, this is the first. Uh, thing and then we have f of x prime v x prime. Okay. And this is uh, something we have actually already seen today. It is this something in disguise. Because look at it. We have, um, say this is one function here function of um, x or x prime uh, we can sort of hopefully we can compute this this uh, integral actually we can um, so this this is a function uh, of omega and then the, if we do this then it's a function of x prime uh, times f of x prime dx prime and all of this is supposed to produce f of x But then this here should be this delta function. And it is. And it is. Right. So therefore, therefore, we have that this thing here, um, you know what? I'll insert the, the limits of integration. <laughs> So uh, they are implicitly is always from minus infinity to infinity, but here I'm now reinserting them just you know so that in your notes you you really have it. Um, this thing here is another way of writing delta x minus x prime because then you know this would actually be f of x. ever so briefly uh, think about it I said this uh, delta function is defined by this uh, somewhat crazy properties we looked into earlier and now we have uncovered a different way of writing it um, and, and you know given what we discussed earlier this one looks actually more manageable so at least this involves things we are used to this is just just integration right? uh, but it turns out that these are crazy integrals. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it does, does not really help. It does not really, really help. Yeah. So there we are. Um, and, and it has to be this way, right? It has to be this way because sort of if we compute the inverse Fourier transform, that is, that is we, we have the Fourier transform of the function and compute the inverse, we expect to get the function back. But this is to say that, that um, this is a different way of writing this, and in the Fourier transform we are not usually expressing it like that. Um, but, but there you have it again, but in, in a sense this is just sort of a convolution with, with this uh, delta function. So things are really intricate, right? really intricate. Lots of uh, <laughs> convoluted um, findings here. But what we're really after, what we're really after is to, to 
to understand, mm, let's say, the geometry of the of the Fourier transform. And um, so we move on to the next deeper insight into what we have learned so far without having made it explicit. explicit. Um, and in order to do that, we ever so briefly have to look into the notion of uh, operators in infinite dimensional spaces. So there are many operators in um, or on that does not make a difference on on infinite dimensional vectors. And my, again, to make a long story short, what we are interested in is the following situation. We are given uh, such a vector and we apply an operator to it and I call it T, I don't know, T for transformation because it's just a placeholder and this um, is supposed to produce another vector. And this is, this is just um, straightforward straightforward extension of what we know if we multiply a matrix to a vector v and we get a vector w. So with the vectors we are all familiar with, uh, we know that we may multiply a matrix to the vector and we get a new vector. And this is just now with, with our new notation, we have some operator, we apply it to a vector, we get a new vector. Right? The difference is that these vectors are well, slightly more involved objects than the vectors over there. Um, let's be precise. Let's be precise and uh, look at an operator we are used to. So, one example we could look into is the operation of differentiation. Which is to say, if we are given a function f, a vector in these infinite dimensional vector spaces, um, and we want to get its derivative, v dx f, we may now understand this uh, procedure of deriving a function with respect to its uh, argument, a uh, variable, as applying an operator, let's call it D for differentiation, to this vector. Right. And here's one thing I encourage you to verify at home. Um, do you remember when we talked about the differentiation of images at the very beginning of the lecture? And I said, well, yeah, these you know, are discrete things and we have to have um, some sort of a discrete uh, representation of this idea of differentiation and let's, let's do it with these differences. Right? What I encourage you to do at home, which may come in handy in the exam, I'm just saying, is uh, do this with finite dimensional vectors. Right? Uh, I don't know, have some discrete function, say x squared, write it as a vector, and write its discrete derivative as a vector and think about how this uh, operator would have to look like. Right? Just as we did in the, in the very uh, first lecture where we had like, I don't know, x i square, it was discrete i square for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, make, I don't know, make it 5, whatever, like some finite, finite dimension. Write this as, as a vector of five elements, compute the derivative, write it as a vector of five elements and think about how this matrix would have to look like to produce that. And then be amazed and find, oh yeah, it really works. We can indeed think of these kind of um, differentiations of functions as the application of matrices to vectors. Right? And this is what we're doing here. But these vectors are, again, continuous vectors and not the uh, discrete functions I just mentioned. And um, this does not not yet, you know, tell us much. Right? Okay, so we say we, we have a function and um, we want to compute its, its derivative, so we want to turn this into that, 
And um, so there must be an operator that does that. This is, I already also said that differentiation is a linear operation, and so we can always assume that we may express it like that. Um, but this does not tell us anything about this D so far. And we will therefore look into how the elements, sort of the entries of this infinite dimensional matrix, look like. Grand finale. So we ask, um, what are the, and I put it in quotation marks, matrix elements of this operator D? Um, and I said quotation marks because this, you know, we can think of them as matrices, but they are really very, very large things. We cannot write them down. That would take for forever. Now let us consider this. Consider this. Um, and I'll, I'll begin building this equation from here. So um, we do want to apply an operator to a function and want that to be the um, differentiation of the function. So it's basically to say that this operator is supposed to turn the function into its derivative. Now, I can uh, just as well left multiply uh, this equation with a basis vector x. Uh, do that here. And then, uh, given all we have discussed so far, we find that this expression now is um, d dx f f x. That's not that is correct. And um, that that is okay. This is this is something we have uh, discussed in the previous class. And um, I will again uh, resort to this crazy trick we have been using a couple of times already. I will insert the identity operator into this equation. So I insert the identity identity, and we get, and I'll do this like so, uh, x times operator d, and now here is the identity matrix. Right. Whenever we integrate over this thing, we don't do anything. It's just a very fancy way of writing the unit, uh, the, the identity operator, and we know that this doesn't do anything, but it gives us a new perspective on what is going on here. Right? And this is still supposed to be d dx f of x. But um, then, Given everything we have discussed so far, uh, in order for this to make sense in light of what we have discussed so far, uh, I will call this here now sort of the x x prime element of this operator, because basically compute uh, this operator applied to this, and then from the left hand side that one, and this gives us a scalar. So this is one element of this operator, it, it's single. These are basis vectors. If we carry out this multiplication with basis vectors with usual matrices, it gives us sort of the corresponding element in that matrix, all right? So this is the dx x prime element. And in order for this to make sense, given what we have discussed so far, this must be uh, the derivative. Uh, I'll first write it like this again. which we saw uh, is the same as delta of x minus x prime d dx. Tja, there you have it. If <laughs> well, this is all, you know, enjoy it. It's, it's, and again, no, we're not asked about this in the exam. Uh, enjoy it. Um, you have just learned that differentiation of a function is indeed uh, a linear operation. We, we know that because it has the properties we say something has to have to be linear. Um, but now we have actually seen that indeed 
um, in a very particular vector space, this differentiation of a function is just matrix vector multiplication. And um, we have now looked into um, how do the elements of this matrix look like, and we again find these crazy basis vectors, but now in their derivative. So in that sense, uh, if you derive a function, what you do is you um, apply an operator to the function that contains of all the possible derivatives of this uh, delta function. And now it gets really crazy. Um, it gets even crazier than this, right? Because now I actually have to ask you for a leap of faith for just blindly accepting what we are going to do next. Um, because uh, <laughs> if you were to ask me where this comes from, uh, then I could not really answer that. Um, it has to be genius insight. Um, but now that we have ever so briefly familiarized ourselves with operators, we will consider a particular operator. Now consider uh, an operator, I will call it capital omega, this is foreshadowing, uh, capital omega, and it is supposed to be defined as minus i, convex, uh, complex uh, unit here, times the operator d we just discussed. So omega is basically differentiation times minus i, and this i is the uh, complex unit. Uh, this is a so-called uh, Hermitian operator. Is a Hermitian operator, which is to say that um, it is equal. So omega is equal omega star, and this is to say that it is equal to its transposed complex conjugated. So what we do when we compute omega star is we flip it above the main diagonal and conjugate all its entries. And this is um, the generalization, so the idea of Hermitian operators, uh, generalization of um, a symmetric, symmetric real valued matrix where we have um, m equals its Transpose. So once again, um, for real valued matrices, some of them we call symmetric, and those are the ones uh, that equal their transpose. And uh, this is obviously, well, again, obviously, um, a generalized matrix which contains complex values. Right? And this means we transpose it and at the same time complex conjugate it. And this, this is the star is thus a generalization of this uh, transpose here. Operators that have this property, that they equal their complex conjugated transpose, are called Hermitian. And they are at the heart of, of all our physics, basically. Okay, um, now, now comes the leap of faith. Uh, so the first leap of faith, one way we, we introduce it and we define it like that. I, I don't even know why that ever happened. Somebody must have had a stroke of genius, the inside, because you'll see where this will lead to. Um, I will now ask for the eigenvectors of this operator omega. So, the uh, question is, what are the eigenvectors of omega? And uh, I probably should say eigenvectors, uh, so eigenvectors omega of To answer this question, we consider the eigenvector eigenvalue equation. That is, in order for this cat omega to be an eigenvector of omega, it has to meet the property that if we apply omega to it, this is supposed to be the same as if we were to scale it with a number. Now, there are lots of omegas here. This is a bit unfortunate, but um, can't do much about it. Uh, this omega here is not 
this omega. This omega is inside these um, brackety things. So this is a vector and this is just a number. Okay, and we will continue as always. We now uh, left multiply something to this equation, uh, namely a basis vector. So we have x omega omega and on the right hand side we then get omega x times omega. Okay? Um, nothing really special. I will um, give this thing a name right? because look at it once again. This this is an inner product between two functions. Right? The one functions happens to be a basis function, but this is an inner product between two functions, and we know that this inner product singles out the value of whatever this function is as x. And I will give this function a different name now. Um, that is, I will now at, on the right hand side of the equation switch from the vector representation to the function representation we are used to. Right? And um, that is, I will define the right hand side to be, well, factor omega, and this one here shall be called psi omega of x. Another funny Greek letter here, uh, psi, and um, well, this is just to indicate, as you see, I've, I'm using Psi omega here, because otherwise it would be too many omegas. Capital omega is already gone. Uh, <laughs> this is just to say that we do have um, a function here, and well, we are interested in how that one looks like. Um, okay, right. so we will erase that and continue here. Continue here. And I will continue um, again by inserting this, this identity operator. Uh, so all of this can also be written as the integral where we have x omega and now x prime, x prime omega dx prime. This is again this trick that we um, insert something that does nothing, but by inserting this something we get a new perspective on what is going on. And on the right hand side we still have omega times psi omega of x. Now, um, well we, we just discussed the matrix elements of D and found that they were these uh, delta functions derived. So, and since uh, omega is just the scaled differential, the, this, this factor of minus i in front of it, um, we can immediately replace that um, correspondingly. So this is just the integral minus i uh, delta x minus x prime uh, d dx. And this here is, is, again, obviously, please excuse my choose of words, uh, this here is psi omega at x prime. Right? These are tricks we have seen a couple of times by now. x prime, dx prime. On the right hand side, nothing changes. Omega x. Okay, and um, again, this is something we have seen before. This is just sort of the derivative of this thing, but there is this funny factor of minus i in front of it. So in the end, what we obtain from all of this is the following equation, minus i d <coughs> dx psi omega of x equals omega psi omega of x. This one is called equation 5. Um, can you follow me? Was that okay? All right. We, um, you know, introduced this funny operator, and we considered its uh, action on. Uh, well, we, we are about to to um, have a look at its eigenvectors, so we wrote down the eigenvector eigenvalue equation. We left multiplied something on both sides of the equation sign. Then we inserted this identity operator, which is really a neat trick. It does nothing to the equation, but it um, allows us to give new meaning to the uh, components of this equation. 
And so in particular, we may replace this expression here, product between x prime and omega, uh, by psi omega at x prime. Right? And this thing here, we had a look at on the previous whiteboard. There it was d, but omega is just minus i times d. And so blah, 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 we insert whatever we found for that previously. And if we then compute this integral, we know that you know, this, this integral of the delta function is just the value of this function. Right? But since we have this derivative here, that is what we get. Now, what, what have we found here? What is that? What we found? This is a differential equation, right? We have a function which is uh, supposed to be derived. And on the right hand side of the equation is another occurrence of that function. Where differential equations are something you know really really common in, in many areas of science, um, and uh, differential equations of that form are in particular important and common. And do you already know the solution to this uh, equation, or, or can you tell me, like at least if if not precisely, but how would psi omega this function have to look like so that this equation is true? It must be an exponential. Very good. This is uh, this this thing. You know, is you always find that solutions to these kind of equations where you have the derivative of the function on the one hand side and, and the original function. It must be an exponential function. Very good. Very good. So we observe that this equation phi is a, well, yeah, simple, it really is a simple differential equation, trust me, a simple differential equation. And you already said it, it has a solution, or I would say, like with solution, with solution, and I write it down. The general solution to this problem I just erased is psi omega of x equals some constant a times, and now brace yourself, e to the i omega x. If you derive this thing with respect to x, uh, then you will have an i in front of it, but we multiply the, the left hand side with minus i, minus i times i gives one. So this is indeed the solution to this differential equation. Now, is that in any way whatsoever remarkable, given that we have talking about Fourier transforms all the time? Look at what appeared these e to the i omega x things that occur in the Fourier transform. Hmm. Okay, um, and I deliberately um, sort of wrote down the general solution to this equation because regardless of what we multiply to this, if we derive it, it would hold. So we are free to choose um, whatever we want for this a. And so what, what, what would you expect we are going to choose for A? Hmm? Uh, square root of 2 pi, yeah. Good. We are going to choose 1 over square root of 2 pi for that. Why not? Right? So we choose, choose the scale, this is a fancy way of referring to this, this uh, factor here, to be uh, A is 1 over square root of 2 pi. And then, so I'll continue here, and it's basically the consequence of all of that. Then, um, we know that this psi omega x of x, which is another way of writing down this inner product between the basis vector x and this 
uh, eigenvector to omega is now 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the i omega x. And now we are prepared for the grand finale. another identity here as we have done all the time so this is the same as I'll write it down and then discuss it omega in a product with x times uh, x in a product with f dx right. um, think of it uh, this here in a product x and f is just f of x and here we have e to the minus i omega x right. but now it is really, really crucial to remind ourselves that uh, the bras are complex conjugated. Right? We said that the ket omega is 1 over um, square root of 2 pi e to the i omega x, and here we have a minus i omega x. But this is actually the bra, because it's the complex conjugate of that. Right? So, and uh, there we go. Um, we now remove this uh, identity again. <laughs> well, I'll write it down here. This is the same as omega times f. Appreciate that for a second, and then I will erase it. And we look at the inverse Fourier transform. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll try to even more dramatic put it both on the same whiteboard. So this is omega f in a product. For the inverse Fourier transform, we know that it is defined as one over square root of two pi integral e to the i omega x f of omega d omega um, which I may write you know, like so uh, x times omega omega times f d omega I have now um, this isn't, there's no minus here. There's no minus here, so the um, vector omega now appears on the left hand side. And I just sort of uh, insert this, this unit thing here. Uh, I actually don't have to do that because all I do is I replace this f of omega with what we just found. Right. I, I replace this one here, this basically the inner product with this x here. And all of this, of course, is what we would expect it to be. So f of x is just the projection of the function f along the direction of the basis vector x. But we have now really seen that the Fourier transform of a function f of x is an inner product. And in one of the videos I saw that I said it's easy to show that the Fourier transform is actually not as easy to show as you see. Um, but <laughs> depends on your point of view. Uh, no, but there you have it. This, this is really the um, 
Fourier transform is a basis transform. Is a basis transform. We are used to talk about um, vectors in a standard basis. With respect to these finite dimensional vector spaces, we say, okay, the basis vector is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Like these are the standard basis vectors. And we can express every vector in that space as a linear combination over these standard basis vectors. Um, uh, last time and today, we spent quite some time on, um, yeah, well, getting a feeling, not really understanding these basis vectors in these finite dimensional spaces, but these uh, basis vectors x, they are there. And um, of course, we can express every function as a linear combination over these uh, basis vectors. And in particular, the value of the function at some x is the inner product between the function and the basis direction x. And um, here we see that the Fourier transform is something similar. Right? We are given a function and we project it onto a certain set of basis vectors. Why are these omegas basis vectors? Because they are the eigenvectors of an operator and so they are sort of orthogonal. So all the omegas indeed form a orthogonal basis for, for this space, another basis, right? And, and um, to wrap this up, I'll write it down. Transform, transform from a complete basis, I'm just emphasizing it, complete basis consisting of these vectors x to another basis is also complete, I'm not emphasizing it. Omega. And uh, uh, remind ourselves about this, these uh, vectors omega are eigenvectors, eigenvectors of an Hermitian operator. Hermitian operator. Dicula and so on and so forth. Well, that thing was called omega. And it was uh, just to remind ourselves minus i times d. And I have more, but I guess it is not worth uh, going down that road. Uh, we could continue this. <laughs> and, uh, uh, try to answer the question, well, if these omegas are eigenvectors of something, then what about those x's? Right? It turns out, yes, they are eigenvectors of something as well. Um, and then we would find that uh, this operator x, when we, I, you don't have to take notes anymore, this is not, I, I'm just rambling. Um, we could look into uh, this problem. Uh, And would find, yes, that there is indeed um, an operator for which the basis vectors x we are used to are the eigenvectors. And, um, and then it would turn out that um, uh, this thing does um, multiplication, whereas this other thing does differentiation. Uh, and that is with respect to the x basis, I don't know. And uh, wait, give me a second. Yeah, but that this operator, if we were to uncover how it looks like, is, is something like multiplication. And this omega we already, like by definition, saw is, is differentiation. And um, remember that I said the Fourier transform allows us to do differentiation in terms of multiplication. I beg your forgiveness. 
So we could continue, you know, all this crazy stuff and uh, uncover everything I have told you earlier, um, you know, really, really deeply, but uh, ah, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Um, the important thing is that uh, this crazy, these, these integrals we have seen, where I said this is the Fourier transform, and we derived it from the point of view of, um, of calculus, where we said, okay, um, um, periodic functions and um, first a Fourier series, and then, then you have the period become very large, so to, to get to the Fourier transform, and then we have these um, integrals there, and then we can don't really worry about how to compute these integrals because some software does that for us, and then we saw we can use that, and, and, and to what extent we can use that. And um, I promised you before we began studying all of this that in the end I would reconnect it to our discussion we had about vector spaces. Right? And um, that is what we did today. Uh, so uh, once we accept the fact that we may think of these functions we are very used to uh, in terms of infinite dimensional vector spaces, we can begin to think about what are basis systems for these spaces and how do operations in these spaces look like and um, by you know walking down that path we found that the Fourier transform is indeed just a, a linear transform on these vectors in these vector spaces uh, that uh, you know, transforms something from one basis system to another basis system and that is um, very much reminiscent of the idea of rotation we discussed uh, some weeks ago. Right? Where we have one coordinate system and we turn, turn, transform something to another coordinate system. This is exactly what the Fourier transform does. It is a very, very elaborate rotation, but it is just a rotation. And uh, was it you who asked about uh, uh, differentiation as a uh, changing point of view. I don't know, somebody, you were here, right? See, <laughs> I promised you that if we want to, <laughs> we can understand uh, the computation of derivatives as uh, you know, choosing a different point of view on one thing. Um, we discussed back then uh, that, you know, uh, where I said, you know, when we talk about these affine transformations, we may think of them as doing something to the object or changing our point of view. And his question was uh, back then, yeah, but with this example where we computed these derivatives and made this MWAS effect, that is doing something to the object. And I said, yes, by all means and purposes, let's assume that that is doing something to the object. But if we would want to, we could understand it as changing our point of view, right? And uh, today you have seen that uh, we could indeed change our point of view, but that would involve more elaborate objects. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that. Uh, once again, this will not be part of the exam, so don't worry. Um, but what you have learned is that, um, or it's, it's an example for the fact that many of the things uh, you may have learned earlier have much deeper truth attached to it, or there's like much more general principles behind that. And um, what I, I'm, I was trying to do with uh, today's lecture and, and the lecture on Monday is um, just to show that to you. Right? Um, and, and again, the reason is that I basically want to provoke your brains to accept that there is much more out there than you might be used to so far. And if you are willing to um, change your point of view or to accept that there are other um, perspectives on the things uh, we talk about, um, that gives you tremendous power over the things we talk about. The more you understand about something, uh, the, the easier you can manipulate it. And uh, this, this, was, this was just to, to show you that um, yeah, this, this Fourier transform is something that is extremely deep.
in the deep part. And I do that in, uh, in all of uh, the lectures on image processing one because uh, most of the textbooks you may read on image processing uh, rob you from that insight. They, they all begin with the Fourier transform is defined, then there are these two integral equations, and uh, blah, blah. And you never know where it comes from. And now you know it is just a basis transform, and we are all you know, more or less familiar with basis transforms, so this is nothing to be afraid of. It so happens that you know the vector spaces are slightly more elaborate, but it's just changing our point of view. Something like a rotation. That's all there is. Great. That's all for today. Are there any questions? All right. Uh, maybe not, but <laughs> you know, enjoy this. This is you know, it's really this is why you attend university. Uh, to see that, you know, now you, you can, you know, call your mom or dad and say, today I learned something deep. Great. See you on Monday.